Okay, so if people come in late, then uh, they, they missed the initial part. That's that's fine, I guess. Uh, so thank you very much for, for being here. I'm actually uh, extremely excited uh, to have this uh, Digital Humanities uh, Colloquium Series. And I think we have a wonderful first talk, uh, first presentation uh, today. So the idea of this Digital Humanities Colloquium Series is to have a monthly um, a presentation uh, and I'd like to 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 uh, get people in who can give us examples of the research that they're doing or different ideas or problems that they're they're struggling with um, uh, for for all of us to get an idea of what digital humanities is or can be uh, what it can mean in the uh, specifically in the uh, South African context um, but also to perhaps get um, uh, collaborations going. So if you see uh, interesting research, so for example, if you really like this, uh, the research presented today, uh, I think that would be a really nice start to, to get additional uh, collaboration going because digital humanities uh, normally relies heavily on, uh, on collaboration as well. Um, so that's the, the, the underlying idea of the, uh, the colloquium series. Um, if you want, uh, we can send an, an email when the new uh, presentations become available, when we know who's going to present uh, the next month. Um, okay, a few practical uh, things. Um, please keep yourself muted so that we don't have this background noise. Uh, I'll mute myself as well um, once the presentation really starts. Um, if you have questions, say during the presentations or after the presentation, please type them in. Uh, in the chat, um, so I'll uh, then then read them up uh, aloud, and then we can uh, can have a discussion going. Uh, but that's just to to get the practical thing going, so we don't all talk at the same time. Uh, there's one more thing that I realized I didn't send in the uh, in the email. We would very much like to record this session because uh, it will I think it will be a very interesting uh, presentation, and we'd really like to to keep that. So if you really feel like you don't want to be um, uh, in this recording. You don't, I mean, you won't be presenting, you won't, won't have your video there. So I think everything will be uh, fine, but we will uh, very much like to record this, uh, this session. So if you have any problems with that, then please let me know. Um, okay, I think these were the practical things, or at least the ones that I could come up with. Um, so this first presentation will be uh, given by uh, Martin Becker from the University of Johannesburg. So the title is Everything I Knew About Protests Was Wrong. Now to quickly introduce uh, Martin, uh, Martin Becker is a doctoral candidate at uh, UJ and his uh, thesis is titled a Rebellion uh, with a Cause, an inquiry into the nature of South African post-apartheid protests using computational social, social science methods. As an applied social scientist and AI enthusiast, he has worked as, um, as development strategist and social researcher, and he is a former head of strategy and research at the Royal uh, Bafokeng administration, where he led the development of the nation's 20-year vision and strategy. He has served on the advisory panel of the World Econom Economic Forum for Sustainable Mining and Minerals, and Becker holds an MA from the University of Bradford, and an MSc in Development Management from the London School of Economics. Uh, so I'm actually very, very excited that he's going to give this presentation here today. Um, that also means that I'll now stop my share so he can actually share his screen uh, and I'll mute myself and then Martin uh, has the virtual floor. Martin, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor from Zahn. That's uh, very kind. And I'm afraid after such an introduction, the best I can hope for is only slight disappointment. Um, so let me see. Can you see my desktop? Can you see the screen? Can, uh, yes. Professor from yes, Zahn, can you confirm that? Okay, yep. right. So let's, let's go ahead. Let me just make sure this is moving in the way that it's supposed to move. Fantastic. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to everyone who's joined and thank you for the, as I said, the kind introduction. What I hope to do in 35 minutes uh, or so is basically uh, address two topics. The one is 
um, computational social science and the methods behind it with a very particular application to what I did. Um, and then I want to talk about protests. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with protests and end with it. Uh, and that's really the, the, the part that I delved into. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions on both. Um, both were a discovery for me. So my, my personal background is, as you heard, um, I studied philosophy and development and conflict resolution. And I worked in a policy space um, and in a developmental space, uh, chiefly with the, with the Bafo King, but with other traditional communities as well. Um, and then uh, had the appetite, I suppose, uh, for a doctorate um, and realized halfway in that what I thought I would be able to do manually, I couldn't do. Um, and I had to discover this, uh, this, this wonderful field. Um, so let's begin with protests and say that we have a country um, that we know we have a lot of protests, right? Um, and protests are important because it's a sign of social distress. It's a, um, it's a sign of some break in a social contract, uh, perhaps desperation, um, and certainly from the state's perspective, the concern that there's a challenge to the state, a challenge to the governing model. Um, uh, and from below, it's often seen that the protest harbors emancipatory potential, right? Um, so because it is a problematic social phenomenon or social phenomenon expressing uh, problems, um, it's also a magnet for uh, social scientists of various ilks to try and explain that. And of course, we have a, almost a cottage industry in South Africa of social scientists from uh, international relations and uh, political science, uh, affiliated disciplines through to sociology, but really all the way through to, um, to psychology and group psychological studies to say, uh, how do we account for all the protests we have in, in, in South Africa? Um, they're international scholars as, as well, but ours seem to be a, a sort of a particular concoction of our history and the local conditions um, to account for that. And, and what, what concerned me as an outsider, um, not as a, a pure academic, when I started reading the literature, was the the juxtapositioning between all these theories. So you had certain theories that just didn't gel with others. Just one easy example is that if you take a very prominent scholar like uh, Susan Boyson over at uh, Witz at the time now with, with Mistra, uh, she would uh, follow almost in a, in a naive way the, the thesis of service delivery protests, right? We have communities that rise up because of poor services and therefore they protest. Um, over at, at Poch of Sturm, uh, Andre Devenar would write exactly the opposite. He would say that it's where you have good services that people have rising expectations that they will want more. And therefore uh, that drives protests. Um, so, <laughs> and then you have these kind of one factor explanations as well. Uh, plenty of scholars who, who do that for protests, for public violence, for even xenophobia. Um, it's always seen as an urban phenomenon in all of the literature, um, including that of um, my supervisor even. Um, so I, I comb these out into a whole bunch of Ds just because I like alliteration. So I saw that there are theories of, uh, of poverty or sort of desperation, right? So of poverty or unemployment that account for this is why people protest. Um, there are theories of deprivation, relative deprivation, in other words, uh, you know, inequality. Um, the theories around delivery, be they municipal services or the actual governance within specifically municipalities, specifically local municipalities. The theories around democracy, participation and governance. Um, the theories about diplomas, in other words, levels of education. Um, around demographics, be that the gender composition, the, uh, the, whether they are foreigners in the area, um, and of course the age structure of, uh, of a local area. And then harking back to, to the apartheid history, there are theories about the designation. In other words, how people were classified 
uh, within Group Areas Act and just you know racial racial classification, and the reminder that the violence that was visited on 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 blacks was uh, shielded or, or whites were shielded from that. Um, so you had this sort of uh, pseudo, I suppose, peaceful society and a very uh, violent society, uh, violent, violence visited on a lot of people, um, on a whole section of society, and of course the majority, and that this would perpetuate intergenerationally, that that can't just be wished away. Um, so I wanted to test it, um, to say, well, is, is there a way to look at the total amount of protests or the total phenomenon and match that somehow to the conditions? Uh, because it was concerning to me as uh, primarily someone just interested in data, um, like why are we not dealing with the, the, the data that is available if we want to design policy, um, policy through from policing, uh, so at the micro level, but all the way through to developmental policy in terms of the National Development Plan, etc. So uh, typically scholars do one of two things, either they use case studies, um, and that could be almost, you know, a participant observation, uh, sort of at the ethnographic level or at the activist uh, level. And a lot of scholars uh, looking at protests are of a leftist uh, bent, uh, myself included, but certainly not at the level of scholar activists um, who do case studies. And they do three or four, maybe five protest prone sites and they talk to people. Um, and they write theories based on that, which is obviously highly problematic, firstly, because it's of a low end that they then generalize uh, to a broader phenomenon, but also because what you obs observe at the low level is, is obviously the minutia of how to mobilize, how to get people into the streets, what are the best uh, tactics to get the media's attention, etc. Um, not what are the big drivers? What are the systematic forces that lead to that? Um, and we know as social scientists anyway, that we don't often understand our own motivations. There are violences, if you like, in the background that make us uncomfortable. Something goes wrong and we use that as a scapegoat, but that isn't necessarily the driving force. The other source of data is from the media. So, so people would use media aggregated data sets to look at the total phenomenon of protest. And there are international data sets that do that, like, like ATLED um, or GDELT. Um, so these are famous data sets that, that just suck in everything that's published online um, and it's, it, it aggregates that. So you can then say that South Africa had 4,000 protests in X year. This is also highly problematic because that there's a, a lens or a filter, maybe a net of newsworthiness criteria that filters that data, right? Um, so in other words, for something to be written in, in uh, to be caught up in a newspaper, it needs to be violent, uh, so blood or tears or glass or something like that. It needs to be probably big. It certainly needs to be urban for it to be uh, deemed newsworthy. Um, Jane Duncan refers to this as, as riot porn, you know, the fact that it needs to be some e form of extremeness around it uh, for it to feature. Um, and that is then replicated in, in, in academic studies. So the luck I had was that I didn't have to use either of the above. I found that the uh, South African Police Service gathers some a data set called IRIS, an incident registration information system where all crowd incidents that they attend are captured in. So whether that is a Shembe church with, you know, a million people doing a New Year's uh, service, or whether there's a, uh, a protest outside a pep store um, out in Swazirenica where, you know, 15 people are demanding that uh, one of their colleagues who were dismissed is reinstated. The police have to, uh, um, the public order police, um, sort of commonly referred to as riot police, but the public order police go and they, they capture that event. Um, now, the thing about IRIS as a data set is that it's very good and it's very bad. And what I mean by that is it's good in the sense that it's not assembled with the public gaze or with scholarly gaze in mind. It's the police reporting to themselves each incident that they, that they go to. Um, and of course, the 
initial uh, procurement, not financial procurement, but the initial procurement of this list was also a, a very difficult process because it contains such uh, um, sensitive information. Um, and there's a whole set of ethics around dealing with this information that I'd, I'd happy to, to discuss uh, afterwards if we want to probe that. But unfortunately, the content itself isn't great. Um, so if you imagine just, just a bunch of uh, Excel columns uh, or, or data sheet columns, it's about 150,000, 160,000 records over a 17 year period. Many of them are, of course, not protests, sports matches, church gatherings, fates, those kind of things. Um, but it, it, one would report the motive. And unfortunately, none of what the motives are stated uh, are actually usable. Uh, if, you, if you relate that to what actually happened at the event, it's completely inconsistent. Another column would capture whether it was violent or non-violent. Even that, I couldn't, I couldn't use at all. So there were sort of 12 or 14 columns. What I could use um, primarily was the unit. Uh, so where did the, uh, who dispatched the, 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 um, the public order police? And then the very last column was something called notes. And that was an account, probably five to 10 sentences, but sometimes a lot longer, where the actual dispatch notes were written down. So uh, something like um, at uh, 10, uh, 10 05, uh, office, warrant officer such and such uh, called in to say that there are 15 people gathering outside. Um, the local municipality building in, uh, in Kimberley, in Salt Plaiki, uh, local uh, municipal uh, district, um, oh, sorry, in the local municipality. Um, they're waving placards that say down with the mayor. Um, another placard says um, down with corruption. Um, then uh, at 10, 20, the crowd has grown to 70 people. Um, and so on and so forth. The account would be kept verbally written down, typed with lots of spelling errors and, and strange spaces and all sorts of funny things. Um, but it, it, it accounts for the whole event um, until it's dispersed. Um, so what I wanted to do was essentially see if I could look at every single protest uh, event that's occurred over that 17 year period. So it started in, 2000, in 90, uh, 1997 and it uh, stretched all the way to, uh, to 2013. Um, so that's the data set I had. And I wanted to see, can I climb into that, extract the protest events and perhaps see what type of protests they were? Were they community protests, uh, labor related or something else, you know, against uh, education facilities or health or against the police or against central government um, uh, and at le what level of violence or what level of tumult were they and then maybe map them to municipalities so that's what I wanted to what I wanted to do and I set out quite naively um, reading just just reading accounts and I, I and I, I told my supervisors to go away I will read all of this um, and I realized after three months of reading that this, this was absolutely, uh, you know, a fool's errand. It, it would never work. It was so much in terms of volume that I would never get through it. Um, so, okay, what did I do? I combined a whole set, a bunch of data sets. It didn't come in a, in, a, in a single file. I did some elementary cleaning that I could do automatically. Um, I uh, uh, later, but I'm presenting it now, uh, wrote a little script to extract the crowd size. So basically the largest number from that, uh, from the police notes. So if it says the crowd was 15 people and then it was 25, uh, it was 50, grew to 50, and then later it was 30 again, then it retains the 50 but it discards uh, improbable large numbers. So phone numbers, ID numbers, car registration numbers, and things like that. Um, so then I set off reading and I created a whole bunch of extra columns. Uh, so every time I read one of these accounts, I would say uh, with a one or a, or a zero basically, what is the actor involved? So there was a column for, was there a union involved? Was there a, 
uh, community organization involved? Was there a, a group of scholars involved? In each case, zero, one, zero, one. So I had actors, I had uh, what were the tactics? So what was the actual action? Uh, was it the handing of a memorandum? Was it a, a, a march? Um, all the way through to more violent tactics like uh, hostage taking or an outright attack of some sorts. Um, and I realized that a lot of uh, uh, tactics are somewhere in the middle that you shouldn't classify as violent but they're not orderly or peaceful as well. Something, for instance, like the blocking of a thoroughfare, you know, like tires in the road. So clearly that's disruptive, um, but it's not attacking uh, as such. And there's good academic precedent in social movement theory to say that you should have a three-way categorization. Um, so I set of doing that, identifying the grievances, uh, about 30 grievances or so, uh, 10 type of weapons, and basically just populating this reading case by case and then uh, adding zeros or ones. And it was obviously, as you can imagine, it was, took a crazy long time. And I realized that I would not finish this. Um, and that's when I started reading up about, uh, and it started with a basic um, search for, you know, can a machine read for you? Uh, because I'm a philosophy student in development studies, right? Um, I know you're all on mute, but I hope you're chuckling at least. Um, and I realized that that is possible. So um, using my own uh, sort of, well, free resources online, I taught myself to, to code um, uh, and to use the necessary libraries um this is done mostly in python um but i mean if you go this journey you pick up a couple of other languages as well in the process um and then using machine learning to uh, uh to, to classify so i realized that this would be possible and i could do that and i put myself through that journey um and i'll, I'll i suppose i can talk a little bit more about that so the next thing i did to the data itself was to say, well, these the uh, 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 columns that I created, I can I can populate them automatically by a keyword search of this text. So I could say, uh, uh, was there a union? Yes or no? Just sort of an if statement, you know, if and else statement. Um, if any of these words come up, and I could list, you know, thirty odd unions, um, uh, uh, trade unions. Uh, or words like shop steward or something like that. And if any of those words flag up, then say it's a, it's a union, yes or no. So I was able to create uh, what people often refer to as an ontology. It's basically a keyword list um, with all these uh, categories. And perhaps I had sort of a hundred columns in the end, additional columns that I created with, with zeros or ones, fairly sparse. Um, and that could be automatically done for the entire... Um, 150,000 records. What I'd also then did um, was hand code uh, about a thousand of the records, so a very small subset, um, into a classification. Was this non-protest, orderly protest, disruptive, that middle category of blocking roads, or was it actually violent? And with, uh, with a thousand cases, I had enough to train a machine learner. Um, or well, we don't have to look at the process uh, as such for now. So a reminder or, or maybe a very gentle introduction if, uh, to machine learning. And if you, if you are a computer scientist or advanced in machine learning, then uh, I'll allow you to look away and cringe right now. But the idea is that if we're working with labeled data, in other words, where I have data with the features, um, the characteristics, if the, the X uh, variable, if you like. In my case, these columns that were derived from the notes, you know, was there uh, uh, weapons involved, yes or no, those kind of columns. And the label, which is the, the, the Y variable, the thing that I want to determine. Um, so I had labeled um, a, a thousand records, and my idea was to classify those. Um, so I had labeled data and I wanted to attach, affix new labels to the ANSI data, the, the, the rest of the IRIS data set. And the process of machine learning is showing an algorithm 
both the features and the label that you want sufficient times such as that using a loss function of sorts that this algorithm says okay i think i know how to determine what you want by looking at the features give me some unseen cases you then give the algorithm some unseen cases where you know the answer but you don't show it to the algorithm it tries to predict in this case it's called to classify right so it can be to regress a number to recommend an object or to classify and in my case i wanted it to classify is it non-protest is it orderly disruptive or violent and then i compare that to what i actually uh, gave it myself in terms of the uh, the allocation and if that score is, is, and there are ways through something called a confusion matrix that you can then say, okay, this is good enough for me. So this algorithm is strong enough. I can use that to, I can unleash that on the rest of the data and I trust it, that it will be sufficiently uh, accurate, although accuracy is not exactly what you're going for, but it's in, in, in layman's terms, it's sufficiently accurate to score the rest of the data um, as if I would do it myself. Uh, and it does that in, you know, a question of minutes for a data set like this. So all of a sudden, I had the entire iris um, classified in, in four ways. And I could take away all the non-protest cases, and I was left with the protest cases. Th then the last bit that was sort of really tough was to allocate this to municipalities. So I wanted to allocate each case, and there were 89,000 remaining cases to municipalities. Uh, I see I'm going way too slow, so I'll have to speed up now a little bit. Um, and just to say that, you know, I would read, for instance, if you're in, in Poch of Sturm, uh, there is a informal settlement outside Poch of Sturm called, uh, I think, Lebanon, or it could be co called Beirut. Uh, I was not 100% sure. Uh, you would read that in the notes and you'd go, well, I have no idea where this is. So you'd look at IEC data for, uh, you know, election centers. You'd look at subplace uh, labels from Stats SA. But in the end, we have 235 local municipalities. I'm adding them the, the metros as well. And I was able to allocate each of them using sort of uh, slight fuzzy logic uh, style reasoning into all of these. So now that I had every protest case over a 17 year period assigned into a bucket of one of the municipalities, uh, and I used the municipalities as they were in 2011, um, I could use 2011 uh, uh, stats, uh, especially uh, from the census, from Statistics SA, um, to match that with what was the, the level of poverty, what was the inequality at the local municipal level, how many people had reticulated water, um, what was the gender composition? What was the racial composition? How many people didn't speak a South African language as their first language? Um, I could also use COCTA and Auditor General reports to say what was the quality of governance as rated uh, by the appropriate agencies. And I could all do that within the municipal frame. Um, and then I could uh, start doing some tests. Now, what was fascinating was every other study hitherto had used counts, right? They would say in uh, South Africa, we had, for argument's sake, 4,000 protests in this year. That's just a count. I could do, because I was at the municipal level, I could say we had so many protests per capita. So in other words, that the municipalities uh, with more people could be sort of diluted in a way so that it's more representative. But more than that, I can do a third thing that I call general propensity. And that's to say, how many protesters, like what were the crowd sizes per capita, um, which is a completely different kettle of fish from just reporting count data. And then I could do regressions and say, okay, so what are the local conditions that actually match up or, or seem to predict protest? Not necessarily cause it, drive it, animate it, but that there is some, uh, that there is some correlation uh, going. So the results, if I, if I go through this, uh, uh, I, su I suppose I'm going to sort of fly through them and maybe we can tease them out a little bit. So I'm moving away from the methods, which 
what I've just demonstrated is one method within the computational social science to the findings. So we're back towards a sort of a, a sociological perspective, possibly, I suppose, political science as well. I found that we had about 14, one, four protests per day over that 17 year period. So 89,000 protests in, in, that, in, in that period. Um, so that is significantly more than any of the estimates um, and any of the, 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 the previous studies, mostly, as I said, based on case studies or on media. Uh, and uh, nobody had systematically studied IRIS. I mean, people had done sort of subsamples and then extrapolated upwards with all sorts of caveats. But we saw that protest is super common. Um, I saw that there's an increase over time, but not as sharp as increase as the media or maybe the Institute for Race Relations would have you would have you think. Um, I also saw that the patterns of the types of protest vary over time, and I'll show you a, 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 a graph of this in a second. I saw, however, that the tumult, the level of violence or disruption attending protest on the aggregate has, has, has actually stayed fairly level over time. So narratives that were expressed, especially in grey literature, about uh, that, that protests are becoming more violent and it's sort of uh, descending into a praetorian society or something are, are, are just straight up false. Um, the crowd sizes also gave me a, a very interesting perspective, and that is if you take crowd sizes and local population sizes into account, then protest is not strictly speaking, only an urban phenomenon, but that there's a strong rural dimension to that, that you have, especially areas in the Northwest and in the Northern Cape, uh, even in less densely populated areas of the of Western Cape and edges of the Free State, where uh, the propensity for protest is actually quite high, um, different to how it was previously understood. So uh, this graphic here looks at the uh, well, I'm indicating to my screen, <laughs> I should probably do like a weather report thing. Um, but what you see there, if you, if you look at the, um, the yellow line, is that if you start in 2007, um, and you see how it uh, sort of plays around, I suppose, with the blue line, that's the community uh, protests. So there's labor related protests and community related protests as the big types. Um, there's a kind of a, a bit of an exchange, but if you look towards the end and you see that labor related protests really picked up from sort of the end of 2008 onwards. Um, and my understanding of that is that it, that has increased uh, that, that gap, that differential, which sits a little bit uh, uh, difficult with the idea that, you know, it's just uh, a rise of service delivery protests, you know, what I call community protests. And my understanding of that is actually that the local conditions make it extremely uncomfortable for people. People feel um, neglected, disrespected by the state. They see that there is no social mobility and they feel the inequality. And I'll talk about all these things in a second. And they don't see movement. And sometimes this unease boils over into uh, an anti-police protest because the police happened to, uh, for instance, uh, not, you know, there was a gruesome murder of sorts uh, or something absolutely horrible. A child is raped. Um, the community is up in arms, but there were all these simmering tensions that made the area ripe for protest already. And people then go for the police as a, as a scapegoat. Um, this is not completely different to going for this company. Um, the trigger moment might have been that this company uh, dismissed a shop steward or uh, you know, didn't pay a 13th check uh, or that something awful happened at this company in terms of say a racist event, but already the conditions, the underlying conditions were there. Um, or it is a service delivery process because you know, some uh, corruption of the mayor uh, has come to light or whatever else, you know, a foreign shopkeeper uh, beats a child with a shambok and everybody gets, but uh, so what I'm saying is that the type of protest, other than how the media and certainly the business press also reports that, isn't so important as the volume of local protest, because the type of protest is almost, you know, if you repress the one type, then the other comes up, because the underlying conditions are not changing. To depict this in a completely different way, here are these bubbles that you see um, each represent a municipality. Um, 
I wonder, I hope you can see the, the movement of, of, of my mouse uh, because that'll be, that'll be handy in this instance. Um, let's just do that up here. Um, the larger municipalities are, uh, are the larger bubbles. So the size of the bubble is the population size. The scale towards the right is violent. So more violent towards the right, peaceful towards the left. Um, and the number of municipalities uh, on a log scale is uh, sort of up and down. So higher up um, have more uh, protests. Um, so this is not per capita, this is peer out counts. Um, and you see, of course, the unsurprising thing that if there are more people, there are more protests. But certainly that's not the case for, for violence uh, or for tumult. Um, look, for instance, at this inter interesting phenomenon here. Red it refers to Mpumalanga here. And just about all of Mpumalanga sits clustered together in terms of the, the, the let's call it the violence fingerprint, except for one municipality that sits up there, uh, and that's J.B. Marks. Um, so you do see these sort of patterns in terms of uh, local manifestations of repertoires, right, of the, the actual tactics and whether that goes over into violence. And of course, you see localized policing styles as well. It appears that in some areas, it takes less to, uh, to provoke the police into uh, violent action. Um, the overall counts not a, not an interesting picture. Um, so the the red areas there that are the uh, areas with high number of protests. These are counts. Remember, just counting them one, two, three. Well, those are the areas where there are more people living. Um, the the one that's sort of on the border of the Free State there in the Northern Cape. That's that's around Kimberley. But the rest are all in the expected places: uh, Itequini, Cape Town, Ekurleni, Joburg. Um, if, however, you look at it per capita um, uh, protests, uh, and now I'm not only looking at community protests per capita, you see very different patterns. So now you see uh, uh, alienation, municipal neglect, uh, uh, disconnect, a political disconnect. You see a completely different pattern. And we can come back to that if you want. Um, but the same for labor, labor related protests. And, and look at that belt across the country in the north. So that's basically related to the mining industry, right? So, you know, iron mines out. Uh, so you start, uh, you know, sort of Tabazambi, I suppose, or all the way through, you can see the platinum belt. Um, that one in the northwest, that's a little bit darker. That's uh, Rustenburg local municipality, uh, but it sort of flows through into the northern Cape there around Sishin and Katu and, you know, the mining and then all the way to uh, Alexander Bay uh, on, the, on the west coast. Right at the bottom in the middle, that's around the, you know, East London and the automotive industry. So there you see uh, labor related protests per capita a very different pattern uh, often to how it's depicted elsewhere. Um, tumult is mostly a, a, a mixed picture. So, so it's, it's, it's violent uh, in a fairly unpredictable way, we find, except if you, if you turn your eyes over to Mpumalanga, where basically everything, uh, all protests are tending towards, uh, towards the, the, the violent type. Although in general, uh, I should remind you that only 10% of protests are violent. Um, but but uh, I mean, for, for the South African picture. But Mpumalanga has an interesting thing. And if you look at that little bit of Mpumalanga, that's just, sorry, I'm pointing to a screen you can't see. I should do the, the weatherman thing. Um, if you look at that, uh, that bit of Mpumalanga that's just thing, which is lighter, um, that's actually sort of an enclave. It's enveloped by uh, Limpopo mostly and Hutting to the south. That's J.B. Marks. That's the one that looks like it really should be part of Limpopo in terms of its violent signature, if you like, whereas the rest of, of uh, Mpumalanga shows a stark uh, a contrast with the rest, obviously inviting some further inquiry. All right, the last bit is to say, well, when I ran the, re the, the regressions to actually test, okay, I have all the protests and the types and the levels of violence for each municipality. And I also have all the other local characteristics of this municipality. What predicts what? Uh, and how do the theories hold up? Well, the first thing is to say that, of course, single, uh, single causal theories all fell flat because I could use any one thing, poverty, and say, well, yeah, that predicts 
uh, protest quite well. But as soon as I add another something like inequality, the power, the predictive power of, of poverty then goes away. So any single factor theories are pretty poor. Um, I question strongly the role of foreigners in an area. So in other words, uh, whether you have a lot of Zimbabweans or not, it does not predict protest, does not predict local unhappiness at all. Um, whether the level of services is a poor predictor of protest, the level of informality and even the level of poverty are poor predictors of protest when you take the whole picture into account. You have these areas in Free State, Northern Cape, where everybody's poor, nobody protests. I do corroborate theories that say inequality is the key. So if everybody's poor, except for the ones who are stinking rich and they are right next to each other, um, then all of a sudden we do see a flare up in protests. And I could, I could show how just like a one uh, step in the genie caused, uh, or, or, or not caused initially, but was associated with certainly an uptick in protests. Uh, the employment profile was a strong, strong uh, associated, uh, or strongly associated with, with protests and political dissatisfaction as measured by how many people uh, vote. Uh, as a proportion of people who are eligible to vote. Um, so again, causality is not clear. Do people protest and then they are, uh, uh, you know, alienated or there's enemy and therefore they don't vote or the other way around? Uh, do they feel there's corruption and therefore they don't vote and then they protest? I'm not going that far, but I'm saying that political dissatisfaction is a strong uh, player in that mix. And then the demographic profile, where you have a strong youth component you know, the, the ideal age for, for protest seems to be around 27 years old. Like after that, people get more responsible, I suppose, or they take fewer risks. But, um, but there's, a, there's a sort of a, a peak around that. And if your demographic profile, oh my goodness, you've lost me there. If your, if your demographic profile um, is, seems to have a large youth component, then it seems to be ripe uh, for, for protest. Um, well, that's just a graphic depiction of that. By the way, I will share these slides in the notes as soon as the questions start. Um, two last things. The one is to say that uh, I'm quite happy to explore what I used to, to do all of this and everything I, I did was, was free, online courses and online software. Um, there's a little three minute summary of this uh, that is recorded. Um, and I'll also share in the, uh, in the chat box as soon as I have a chance. Uh, just a, a feedback for myself that would be super kind if you would do that and it's just three questions basically did you understand this and and did I speak legibly um, but uh, to Professor von Zahnen and uh, everyone who afforded me this opportunity thank you so much I'm not sure how badly I've gone over time but I'm I'm sure it's pretty bad thank you okay thank you very much uh, Martin um, I, don't, I don't think you went that much over time, but there's still some time for, <laughs> for questions. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I really love this uh, presentation. I think this is a really good example of how you can use computational techniques, not for the purpose of, com of the computational techniques, but really to get more information about what's, what's actually going on. So what information is in the data? Can we then do proper analysis? Can we properly take a look at um, the, the information that's there and then use that in a, in, in a more general sense or more general uh, research sense. Um, okay, so let's quickly take a look at the questions. Actually, there are not that many questions at the moment uh, in the chat. So if people do have questions, you can just uh, put them in the chat and, I'll, and we'll go through them. Uh, there is one question there, um, which tool or software was used for this study? And I was actually quite curious about that myself as well. So perhaps you can say something about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, the the main data management was 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 done in Excel. Um, so just dealing with large amounts of uh, data, like something like uh, Google Sheets or anything else, just crashes um, because it was it was so massive. Um, I started my quest and I'm not joking I went to edX uh, which is you know one of these online platforms for for learning and I uh, and I did a course called Python for absolute beginners um, 
uh, and moved on to uh, you know Python intermediate, <laughs> and, and so we went on. And I did, I did sixteen or seventeen, I suppose, courses of them, and I ended with the um, with Harvard CS fifty. I also did uh, Google's machine learning crash course, um, and in that, you use an integrated development environment uh, called Jupyter Notebooks. But quite frankly, everyone has, if they have a Google account, they have access to something called collaborate or collaboratory um, and and you write your code there should I maybe it's interesting to people should I share screen and just show how to how to go there how to get it uh, Mina would that be helpful or not no, I think that would be uh, would be really nice all right so let's go back there I say desktop and share uh, can you see my screen that, uh, can you basically see my browser at the moment Yes, we can. Okay, so if I go to to Drive, um, and I say New, and on More, if I get to that collaboratory function there, so I went to I went to New, and obviously I I would do it in a sorry I would do it in a folder now, um, but if I go to over on More and I click on that guy over there, that gives me a, a fully functioning development environment where I can where I can code um, and you can code and, and um, uh, well that that would be in Python um, but I think I think you can set it up uh, for C and, and probably um, uh, for C derived uh, languages as well um, but I did it all in Python and I and I used uh, all the Python libraries that are that are free um, and you can link data that's here to uh, stuff that's on your desktop uh, or stuff that's in your Google Drive in terms of data sets that you import um, as uh, something called data frames in, in pandas. Um, I, I worked in, in R, which is a fantastic platform as, as well. Um, and the visualizations in R is, are really good. Um, it's not as well integrated with the, with the Google environment. Um, uh, and the, the, the courses that I did, especially if you want to take it up into sort of the more advanced uh, machine learning stuff, uh, linking with, with TensorFlow and Keras, um, you, need to, you need to be in Python. But the, the principles that you, that you learn in R are probably even more solid. Um, so, and you can do that on, on data camp. Oh gosh, there I fly again. You can do that on data camp, or should I say data camp, um, for free, um, and just get, just get the skills. And it's, it's just a question of Googling around. Um, of course, you've got my details now. So if anyone wants to get into this, don't, you know, struggle in the way that I do, um, but just pop me an email. And, uh, and, um, I think part of this drive is for us to, um, and, and talking yesterday uh, to to Professor Van Zahn is to say that we should be working on establishing a community of people in digital humanities and computational social scientists with our own problems, but using these tools that are available to us to answer our uh, issues, uh, our, our our questions. Um, that it's there, and we should be using it, uh, and it's not that hard. Um, I'm like I say, I, I I'm not strongly mathematically inclined at all philosophy student right um but i managed it it, it took me a while but uh, one manages it completely okay wonderful i think that was a really nice um uh, kind of showcase on on how to do this uh, the uh, the other question is actually very related to what, what you just uh, ended with uh, so how long did it take you to learn uh python specifically for this data analysis and it's, it's quite interesting because I can't yeah. relate. I mean, I studied computer science, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that makes it a, 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 the, the, the wrong example. Yes, I'm really curious how long you, uh, you took to, so, uh, to get a hang of this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think it took me, uh, I think it took me all in about, um, about six months. Um, and I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't doing sort of, you know, coding from morning till night. I mean, I, I did work quite hard, um, but that was to a fairly, uh, <laughs> I'd be careful now because any proper developer would look at me and go, 
Her son, you've got a long way to go. Um, but to, to a fairly advanced level, to such a level that I was comfortable that the data that I would get out, I could use for a PhD <laughs> um, and that I wouldn't get faulted um, by a machine learning examiner who looked at my process and said, listen, this is not, uh, this is not good enough. Um, so, that, so I had this worst case scenario in the back of my head that I have to um, pass, you know, master uh, at a critical level. I think one can sort of within uh, two or three months uh, uh, be very, be very comfortable programming in an object oriented language like, like Python, because it's so, it's so simple. I mean, um, there are such good courses and they generally aimed at, at children. I mean, I know I'm in my thirties. Um, so sometimes you kind of have to swallow your pride because you can see that this is actually like a class for, for kiddos. Um, you're just gonna go, well, I, I don't know this. I really wanna know this. Um, nobody sees me uh, learning this. So, you know, let's just uh, plunge ahead and, and work through it. Um, but I think in a four month period, one can be very comfortable in, uh, in, in, in an environment like Python. I mean, comfortable to the level of debugging other people's code. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds wonderful. Uh, actually, now you mentioned it, my son, so he's 15. Uh, he's trying to learn Python at the moment. And I think the main problem for him is this internal drive. Do you really want to learn this? Because it does take a bit of an effort. Um, and if you want to, if you see what you can do with it, if you understand what you can do with it, then it's, it actually makes sense to take that time. Uh, but for him, he, so he wants to build apps and stuff. And before you reach that point, you need to go through the basic stuff. And that's the, that's a difficult part. Um, so now the, the focus, you focused a bit on, on Python, but um, you also did machine learning. Um, so how, how does that relate? I mean, I, mean, I, I, I would do it in a particular way, uh, but I, I might have a different background from you. So I really like to hear how you, because it, it's not just learning Python, it's you, you've learned Python, you've learned, you know, you at least thought about text analysis and machine learning. So how did you get into the machine learning and how did you kind of get that to work with Python? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, um, in, these, in these online courses, if you go to Coursera, if you go to edX or um, I suppose Udemy probably does it as well, they, they give you a pipeline to say, okay, you want to end um, programming in, in, in TensorFlow, which is Google's machine learning um, environment, um, which, is in, which is coded in Python. Um, and that integrates with Amazon Web Services, so Microsoft Azure, or you know, any of these. Um, uh, they, they, they show you the route. So here are the courses. If you do it and you stick to it uh, within... Uh, three months or, or four months, you're at the level of of writing machine learning applications um, within whatever the uh, the development environment is that you're comfortable with, uh, whether that's something like a Jupyter notebook or uh, something you download, or in my case, in Google Collaboratory in my Google Drive, um, where I couldn't lose stuff. Um, so it's so the roots of of are, are quite simple in terms of that, that they are laid out um, and the courses are very well scaffolded. Um, so the one leads to the next thing. Um, there are three uh, primary libraries in Python. Um, NumPy is something that just helps you to do basic maths. Pandas is something that helps you to deal with, with, with data. And scikit-learn is the, uh, the statistical library that you learn how to use and scikit-learn in that I did all my regressions um, and you do you know ordinary least squares all the way through to negative binomials and uh, robust regressions and a whole bunch of sort of kind of esoteric stuff weighted least squares um, but you also do it's also a machine learning library so it uh, it has a function to uh, normalize data or, or standardize data, to create a train and test split. Um, it helps you to tune the hyperparameters or 
it, it makes it possible for you to tune hyperparameters to select how many epochs you want. In other words, how many times do you want to show it your cases and the labels, cases and the labels, and the algorithm goes over and over and over. Um, so it it, uh, it it kind of breaks that journey down for you. They are excellent courses, and then, you know it's like five or six hours of lectures. Uh, with a few tests in between after would you know how to interpret the output stats of whether this algorithm was a good one or not um, so uh, there's this principle of no free lunch in machine learning which says there are different types of algorithms so there's a, something called a support vector machine there's something called uh, random forests there's a whole bunch of uh, Bayesian uh, uh, regression analyses and, and classifiers you don't know at the start which one is the best for any problem you have to try each of them um, but the Im implementation is is very simple uh, I did play around a little bit with with natural language processing um, that also has a series of steps it's basically like a recipe to bake a cake you sort of uh, study each of these steps understand what it does um, but keep in mind that it's for usage and it's, you know, we're social scientists, right? So it's, what am I going to do with it? Not like all the way down into the map of it. Um, so I did look at that. Unfortunately, I abandoned it uh, for pure practical reasons. And that was that the police notes in uh, that I was going to study was, was badly written and badly captured. It was in multiple languages. Um, uh, so I had, when I created that ontology, uh, I had to have translated versions of that. Um, nowadays, all the police notes are in English, um, but a lot of them were in Afrikaans earlier on. Um, certainly, you know, people would use uh, Ndomjolo or, or, you know, uh, shacks would be spelt sharks uh, or um, shanties or um, like one concept would be given a whole bunch of words so if you wanted to measure informality um, some western parser uh, for english wouldn't wouldn't do at all um, and uh, i couldn't i couldn't get performance on that so i sort of abandoned that uh, but that's because my focus was very much um, get something to help me solve this one problem to understand protests uh, and whatever the tools were were just the ones that worked um, it wasn't a sort of a self-indulgent process although I'd, I'd love to go back and, and learn more about um, computational linguistics and certainly um, it's becoming super accessible as well and again the courses are there the courses are free uh, it just takes a bit of time okay wonderful so this is yeah this yeah, sounds really great I hope you've uh, encouraged some some uh, other people here in the uh, in the meeting to to dive into this. Uh, we, we're uh, slightly uh, over time. I mean, I'm I'm happy to continue talking. We already had a nice nice chat yesterday. Uh, I think we can talk for a few more hours. Uh, <laughs> but um, Absolutely. It, I, I also assume then that people will, would like to leave uh, at some point. So thank you very much for this presentation. I thought it, uh, it it gave a really nice insight in what you can do um, with computational techniques in a, in a social sciences setting. So thank you very much. I really, uh, really appreciate that. And, and like I said, I hope you've uh, encouraged uh, more people here in the um, uh, in the colloquium to also dive into this. Uh, thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. And again, if anyone wants to get in touch, either either via you or, uh, or or directly, I would absolutely welcome that. And to join in a community of social scientists and humanities students working uh, using these tools, I would absolutely encourage that. Thank you and, and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Great. Wonderful. Thank you.